On November 29, 1900, over 19,000 people would flock to Recreation Park in San Francisco to participate in an American Thanksgiving pastime, watching a football game. That day, the Stanford Cardinals played their rivals, California Berkeley. People unable to get in or pay for tickets, mainly locals and boys and men, would watch from the nearby roof of a glassworks. But a fun day, cheering on their chosen team was not in the cards, and by the time the football game would end, the biggest disaster in American sports history would have taken place. In this episode of California True Crime, we cover the big game disaster of 1900. Hello and welcome to this Thanksgiving episode of California True Crime. This episode won't be quite as lighthearted as last year's episode when we talked about the Thanksgiving Day Parade in El Cajon. We will actually be talking about a major sports disaster, but like a lot of the stories that we cover, it's really not quite that simple, especially because it happens in California during the 1900s. And so this is kind of a story about the rich versus the poor. With me to share details for this episode are Sean and Charles. Sean, you're our resident football expert. How are you feeling about this episode? Oh, I'm excited. I just just finished Sunday night football since we're recording on Sunday. So all day football. Now we get to talk about some football. <laughs> and Charles, you're kind of our person always interested in factories. Actually, both of you are really interested in odd historical details. That's what makes this fun. How do you feel about this episode? Excellent. Um, I'm feeling actually, I was really interested when you brought this up to do some research on and then kind of got into it. And I, I can confess, I don't care for football <laughs> at all. It's not, it's not, it is not my cup of tea, but um, I actually got into some of the historical parts and, and that we'll talk about as we go along. So, and yes, you bring up I'm, my love of uh, factories and large machinery. In my research of this topic, I went back to newspapers in San Francisco at the time, so mainly the San Francisco Chronicle, the Examiner, and the San Francisco Call. But this is an event that's only really covered for a few days in those newspapers, and then basically forgotten in history. There's a handful of modern articles on the topic, and we'll link those on our site. But for the most part, this is something I had never heard about, about it before, and it remains still the largest sports disaster in history in America. Had you guys ever heard of it? I have not. When I think of large sporting events that are tragedies, I think of soccer. Because a lot of times, like, the stadium collapses at a soccer thing. Or, But I have not heard of this one, and I didn't even think about it being the largest. No, I'm with you, Sean. You do see some of those reports from, like, other countries and those large stadiums when there's people packed in and things are collapsing. For the United States, every time I hear, like, sports disaster, I honestly think of auto racing with, like, you know, car pileups. You see here of drivers being killed and, you know, um, things like that. Right, or if they have to, like, shoot a horse after a horse race or something like that, too. Right, right. Yeah, sometimes when you, you know, th there's a tragedy or a jockey gets thrown. But I've I've never... Never heard about this one. This one is also interesting because I think it will cover a topic that we've talked a lot about during this last season, which is uh, pure victims. As I said, this is an event, it's a tragedy where a lot of people die and a lot of, even more people get hurt. And yet it's just been kind of lost to history. And I think that goes back to that idea of what a pure victim is. The victims in this story are really seeing as being responsible for what happens to them. They're mainly working class men and honestly, mainly boys. The newspaper will really refer to the victims as men and boys, but the majority of victims are under the age of 19. So they're, the youngest is nine and they're mainly about 13, 14, 15, 16. The paper will refer to those people as men. Mm -hmm. And that's because at this time, they're not going to school any longer. They're working in factories. They're, some of them were like the main breadwinners for their families. So they are considered very differently to what we think of now as adults. I will say, though, I was surprised that football was such a big deal at this time. 
I know that's a pretty common tradition on Thanksgiving Day. Do either of you guys watch football? I mean, Charles. No. You don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, I have no favorite team, but I love fantasy sports. I love numbers. I love gambling. So anything that I can gamble on. And Thanksgiving, yes, is like there's at least three games on. Um, there's a lot of college football. And it's just, it's great. <laughs> I hear fantasy sports and I immediately go to like Quidditch, which I mean, if Quidditch was on TV, I think I might watch it. But no, I, I mean, and you know, like our family, there are sports sometimes on in the background. And when growing up, my, my dad and family would watch a lot of football and I would take that opportunity to either when I was real little, go out and play. Or now I really like uh, spending the majority of my time in the kitchen. So. Yeah, it's definitely something I remember. I associate it with Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. football. We did it a lot. It was always on, and we would would play a lot as kids, or the whole family would go out and throw the ball around, especially when we had extended family come. But um, I had no idea it went back this long. And Charles, you're going to tell us a little bit about that tradition. Yeah, and it really kind of got me thinking because, like you, my family did the same thing. I I do remember going out and throwing the football around, and I I do remember watching it, and and it was not my thing, but like we talked about the hit the history of american football and I, we're going to continue to call it football if you're listening to this abroad it is american football or actually american canadian football not football or soccer so we're american we're going to call it that the american uh the history of american football and thanksgiving has a, a history a lot older than some people might suspect it actually can tra- be traced back to the first football game that was played only 6 years after president abraham lincoln made the thanksgiving a national holiday Uh, This game was played on Thursday, November 24th in 1869 uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was played between the American Cricket Club and the Germantown Cricket Club at 12 o'clock at the Germantown Cricket Club, which is actually still there. It's the oldest sports club in the United States. Uh, I, I thought it was really cool that it was two cricket clubs went at it on the first Thanksgiving football game. So... Basically, Germantown is a neighborhood in Philadelphia that has a long, deep history tied to the American War for Independence. Uh, As an aside, I was researching this place and found that they had uh, way more than a few notable people that were born and raised there. Uh, But the two that caught my attention mostly was uh, Charles Darrow, the original maker of Monopoly, which was copyrighted in 1933. And I just do either of you guys play a lot of Monopoly? I love Monopoly. Okay, so I do too. I really like that game a lot. Jessica? Yeah, I hate Monopoly, as you know. <laughs> I, I knew that, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a sore spot in our house. Uh, Jess really has a passionate hate on for Monopoly, but I just wanted to, to kind of like twist it a little bit that this is where the, the home of Thanksgiving football is also the home of Monopoly. The other person I was really excited about was Walter B. Gibson, and he's the re- writer and creator of The Shadow. Uh, if you're not familiar, The Shadow is a pulp hero from the 1930s. You may, re- may remember in 1994, they made an Alec Baldwin movie about the character called The Shadow. If you haven't heard anything about it, look him up. They were really popular in the 30s and 40s, and, and really since then, he was in comics, radio plays, movies, serials. Which it's just a, a really... so. As a comic book nerd, that really got me excited. So, the this game's actually this this football game in, on Thanksgiving is played only two weeks after the first ever recognized game of football between Rutgers and Princeton universities. Uh, other big ri- rivalries at the time were between Princeton and Yale. They'd play a Thanksgiving game between 1876 and 1881. Uh, and this tradition of rivalries meeting on the football field would grow as the popularity of the sport grew. Uh, In fact, this would actually spill over into the area of high school sports as the oldest school in the United States, which is called Boston Latin School, it's established in April 23rd, 1635, began playing English High School of Boston on Thanksgiving in 1887. These games are played at Harvard University, uh, and it is considered the longest-running Thanksgiving rivalry in American history. And what's crazy is this tradition continues to this day. They have a huge football game. Now, when we say football, it's, it's, it's a totally different sport. In fact, the, the two cricket clubs went at each other with uh, two 21-men teams. So it was 21 men on each team. And from what I get from reading some of the newspaper articles and, and some of the news coverage, it really is 
more akin to rugby. I mean, the ball thrown out in the middle of the field, and these guys just beat the snot out of each other with some semblance of scoring. Uh, it wouldn't be until November 25th, 1920, that the first professional game was on Thanksgiving. Again, this is only 14 years after the first ever real professional league started showing up around the United States and Canada. I also thought that was kind of interesting that when American football gets started, Canadian football is right there. So there's a lot of overplay. Um, It's almost like hockey in in their early days. And this would continue as new tradition uh, for football fans from then on. There would, however, be no games between 1941 and 1945, obviously because of World War II. Some of the more well-known rivalries have their roots here uh, during the early days of the professional leagues. In 1934, Detroit Lions owner J.A. Richards, he basically wants to attract more fans to the games. So again, this is, this is the time of you know, early radio, there's no television. So in, for order, in order for a professional football team to make money, they actually have to have people in the stands. And Richards was angry because the Detroit Tigers, the baseball team, was getting all of the fans and, and, and more traction. So he, what he did was he promoted this game and then broadcast it on his radio show that it would be on Thanksgiving and it would be a big rivalry. And the gamble worked and the stadium sold out and the Detroit Lion football has been a staple in homes ever since. Um, they did lose, however, the first game. Richards didn't necessarily care because he was making money. Um, but still, it was a huge success, and they've gone on to host one of the Thanksgiving d- uh, Day games ever since. Another team that would all will jump on board with this tradition is the Dallas Cowboys, a favorite team of Kathy, our friend uh, of the show, who actually inspired last year's Thanksgiving episode from El Cajon. If you guys, if you guys haven't listened to our El Cajon episode, um, go back and listen to that on the Thanksgiving Day Parade. In 1966, again, only six years after the Dallas Cowboys were f- uh, were formed, they hosted their first ever Thanksgiving game. They played the Cleveland Browns and would win this game and in the process start a tradition. And again, for the Dallas, I thought it was kind of interesting that they used this Thanksgiving tradition as a way of building their brand. So the whole reason they had this game was not necessarily solely to win a football game. It was, we want to make sure that the, the Dallas Cowboys becomes a popular team. So we'll host a game on a, on a popular holiday when people are gathered around with family. The tradition would be expanded when television and football became linked. On Thanksgiving, there would be three games that would be aired, Detroit versus Dallas, or Detroit versus another team, Dallas versus another team, and then usually a third game. They would be aired at 2.30, 4.30, and 8.30, obviously all Eastern times. So again, I thought that was interesting and and that continues, you know, families now. I don't think most people, most families, I know our family is, is like that. If turkey comes out, then f- usually there's football somewhere on in the house. So the day of the big football game between Stanford and Berkeley was a Thursday. As I said, it was November 29th, 1900. This was also Thanksgiving Day. Neither of these institutions at the time had their own football stadiums. So they came to San Francisco to play at a place known as Recreation Park. And the locals often called it Central Park. It was on 16th Street between Folsom and Harrison Street. There would actually be many recreation parks in San Francisco throughout the years. In the 1906 earthquake, this recreation park would be destroyed, as a lot of things in San Francisco were. And when it was rebuilt, it would be also still in the mission, but not in that same location. And they are often remembered because it's one of the places the San Francisco Seals which is a Pacific Coast, or was a Pacific Coast minor league team at the time. And it was a pretty big deal in San Francisco. They would play at at the recreation parks. Is that one of the reasons why the San Francisco uh, mascot is now a seal, Lou Seal? I do know that at the current stadium, there is a seal outside. And it is at the location of where after the, in the 1930s, where they would play. So that, and it was called recreation. No, I think it was called Seal Stadium. Sorry. So that there is that connection. So it's a marker. Okay. Yeah. In 1900, this area of Mission Street would have looked really different than it does now. At this time, it was not highly populated. That really begins after the 1906 earthquake when people move into the area. There are homes there in 1900, and it's really known for its immigrant population. It has mainly Irish and German people living there. Most of everything around the park is unpaved as well, so that's a big difference than it is now. And aside from this park, uh, which is like a big stadium... 
it was mainly an industrial area. So there are factories all around the park. There's the glassworks that we're going to talk about. There are lumber yards. So this is a really working part of town. And in the 1900s, it's kind of a lot like when you're reading the articles. I don't know if you guys have ever read uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Yeah. It really reminds me of that book. And that's the life that these people are living. Most of them living in the area also work in the factories. Many of them are young, um, but a lot of them are, are poor. So this is just mainly a hardcore working area of town with very with none of the rights that we have now for workers. So they're working long hours, they're low pay, they're dangerous jobs. Well, and you talked about the idea of child labor or what we would consider child labor. So, you know, kids in the factories amongst all of the adults, mainly male working force. But also then, you know, like a, like what goes on in a lot of and if you haven't read The Jungle uh, it's it's it is I I re- really enjoyed the book. It's a brutal book to get through, uh, both for the subject matter and the brutalness for of his descriptions of of like the slaughterhouse floors and things. But this is also a time when there's there's not really building codes and the the businesses are kind of left up to their own devices to quote unquote keep their workers safe, which is. Yeah. And the other thing during this time, especially in San Francisco, there's a lot of bribery going on with officials. So if there are laws and there are rules, people are able to bypass them. The police are known to be bribed quite often. It becomes a a thing we have to root out here in California later. Which we talked about in another like another callback episode in our Fong Little Peach Ching episode. If you remember back, we talked a lot about the the number of different police groups that were, were working and that's in the 1880s 1890s and so graft was continue was a was a thing that which is interesting everybody knew it was there and they realized it was almost like a cost of doing business yeah and it will actually come up a little bit here but it's important to know that bribing someone to get what you want is is such a huge thing i saw articles about janitors working in city buildings in san francisco who were bribed and paid off and lived really big luxurious lives but they didn't do any work but because they continued bribing people off and other people were bribing them off, garbage was stacked up in the city, that kind of thing. But I mean, even at the levels we wouldn't quite expect it, people are being bribed to do the wrong thing. And that's actually part of why this story is fascinating, because on this day, this Thanksgiving day, the 29th, people will flow into this area from surrounding areas. Both Stanford and Berkeley are in the Bay Area, so people can come to the city. They're coming by boat by horse, by train, to watch this game. And the majority of these people are people who can afford tickets, who can afford travel, Uh, their family and friends, their alumni of each school, so really a college-going kind of people, which at this time was really generally kind of like a a upper-class thing to do. And so they're going to come to this area where the backdrop is really a working-class neighborhood with very little rights and a lot of immigrants. The game, as it's often referred, is a huge deal, and much of the city is really excited. The newspaper notes that even people who didn't attend colleges were excited, and I think that's because there aren't really a lot of professional sports like we see them now to go to, so this is something you can go out and actually watch and do and enjoy. The paper notes that it will, quote, no doubt be the finest all-round football any of us has ever seen, so no pressure there. Although the paper notes how excited everyone is, it's also sure to note that it's especially important to collegians and something non-collegians wouldn't understand. So even though the city is very excited, the paper wants to make sure that people know the, that this is different for people who go to those schools. So they compare it to Napoleon's Waterloo, and they say for the students of the school that will win this game, it will ensure future success. So not just the players, but for any of the people who go to the school. So that's a lot of pressure for these football players. I also took exception, I think, to a lot of the ways the newspaper is talking about people who aren't college going. It was a more modern article. In a 2012 article in the SF Weekly called Sudden Death, Boys Fell to Their Doom in SF's Forgotten Disaster, the men and boys who watch from the, the roofs, who don't have the money to get in, they're described as, quote, the indigent, the impulsive, the reckless, and the devious. And this is not the overwhelming theme of that particular article. It's a really good article, but I took some exception to people being described that way, partially because I had already researched this. And I know that one of the biggest things to getting in the stadium was that they just didn't have the money. So this kind of bothered me as a way to, of describing the victims. It, again, it's, it's, it seems like it's harkening back to that class divide that you mentioned earlier when the newspapers at the time were reporting on, on this event of 
you have rich upper class elitists coming into a poor neighborhood and then almost pushing out all the people that live there. And most of those, I mean, those kids, most of them probably had full time jobs. Yeah, a lot of them were, were workers. Yeah. There's also a full page spread in the San Francisco newspapers. Um, we'll make sure we have that on our website because it's pretty amazing. They've drawn pictures of all of the team and where they're going to be playing, uh, their numbers. They've compared both teams in different kinds of matchups, talked about how they play football, uh, what the coaches are like. So it's a pretty big event that they're very excited about. And this is partially because these two teams have a long rivalry that Sean is going to tell us about. So yeah, this, this rivalry actually started in 1892. This was the first big game, and this is what it's con- called, the big game. The very first one was actually on March 19th of, 19, of 1892, so it switched to Thanksgiving later. And now, like how you were saying, they don't have they didn't have the field back then. But now, if the game is played in an even number year, it's at Cal Berkeley, and if it's an odd number year, it's at Stanford. Uh, the big game has been played 122 times, with the win in favor of Stanford with 59 wins. Uh, Cal has 44, and there are 10 ties between them. It's neat to think me how young america is and this is just pretty darn old <laughs> for how much yeah. for just real american history to me because college football is like super far back i just think this is pretty neat but um also the stanford cardinals it's not named after a bird it's because of the deep red color and they don't actually have an official mascot but there's a tree that runs around like this this year for covid <laughs> they actually just recently put in like instead of like cardboard cutouts like you've seen in other sporting events they just put trees everywhere in the stadium so nice the cal bears have a very odd looking bear named oski as their mascot he's just his smile is just like a line that goes really high it's just it, it looks <laughs> weird to me now i feel the most um Important part of this rivalry is the Stanford Axe. Uh, this is the the trophy that is won that year, and it it stays in possession until they are beat. If a tie happens, it stays with the team that won to the previous game. So before the axe was created, uh, there was a song that everyone would just start yelling, saying "Give them the axe," and then. After that part, they would say right in the neck. So it sounded really nice, but everyone was like screaming that. And then Stanford made this prop, which is just an axe head and it's on like a wooden frame and it has all the scores underneath it from every game. It was first introduced in 1899 and two days later, it was stolen by Cal students. I'm I'm assuming they got it back, and I don't know if the one that you have today is the original, but I guess there was also some huge heist that was supposed to happen in 1960, and there's like an ESPN thing on it too. So with 122 times meeting, the big game has some some notable ones. Uh, In 1959, Stanford's quarterback Dick Norman, who was drafted by the Bears, By the Chicago Bears. Uh, He had a very tiny, uneventful NFL career. But in this game in 1959, he actually threw 401 yards, which still holds today as the big game record. With that many passing yards, him and his team still lost to the Bears 20 to 17. And 401 really isn't, it doesn't seem that amazing for how many meetings they've have they've had i would just think that they'd had a game with at least like 500 throwing yards you see that in the nfl a lot since like some college games have the like huge scores like we had in the big game in 2013 where stanford beat cal 63 to 13 you would think there would be Oh, yeah, wow. like at least 500 yards. But even then, Stanford's quarterback, Kevin Hogan, only threw for 329 yards, but he did have five touchdowns and four of them going to future Green Bay Packer and now St. Ty Montgomery. So that was pretty neat. But I think one of the most amazing games to talk about in this is the 1982 game that birthed the play. Do you guys know anything about the 1982 game? 
Okay. No. Okay. Uh, I am confidently saying okay. no. Yeah. I have no idea. I like it's it's considered one of the greatest plays in in football history almost. So I I, ha- I found it and I'll, I'll definitely put it on uh, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com and maybe try to get it on social media just so everyone can see it because it, it's just great how it unfolds and the announcing of it was awesome too. But so this this game was pretty tight and towards the end of the game, the Cal Bears were leading 19 to 17 when John Elway, future Cal or Broncos, John Elway takes the Cardinals down the field, which results in a field goal, now making the Stanford Cardinals up by one. So it's 20 to 19. There's a lot more drama that Elway like could have if there was still too much time on the clock. He called the, the timeout too much. There's a lot of controversy with this, but this is about 1900. This is not a football podcast. So let me, I'll just go <laughs> on. Um, so at, at the kickoff, there was like a little squib kick. Which, if you think about, like, skipping a rock on, on a lake, that's kind of like how the kick went. A Cal Bear player caught it, Kevin Moan, and he, he got the ball. There was only four seconds left, so this is going to be the last play. So they, they just started lateraling the ball so to try to keep it going. And after five laterals, it actually came back to Kevin Moan, who's now on the other side of the field, like, close to the end zone around the 25-yard line. When it was only four seconds left, they kick it off. The Stanford band thinks we won the game. It's twenty to it's twenty to nineteen. So the Stanford band just starts walking on the field as the kickoff is happening, and then Kevin Moen is coming down and he's trying to get into the end zone and he's has to try to go through the Stanford band that is now on the field. And as he crosses the end zone, he kind of jumps straight up. And I don't know if it was for the reason of the axe, but he comes down into the end zone with an axe chop. And there just happens to be Gary Terrell there, who is a trombone player for the Stanford band. And he just gets rocked by this giant football player that comes down. And it, it's just, it, it you just hearing the announcer scream. And I guess... Now Gary is kind of a he's kind of a legend now in the Stanford band scene and he was a trombone player and my friend Mary she's all she was also a trombone player for the Stanford band and she said Gary's a, a great guy but she got to play the big game from 93 to 97 and another thing uh we all have a friend our friend Zach who actually played left guard for a few years, including the big game in 1999 where Stanford won 31 to 13. So that's a little history on it. It's a huge thing. The the acts that I watched that video of the play over and over again because it's just so amazing. But I'm I'm excited to see that yeah, video. It's great. Yeah. That makes me want to watch the big game this year. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. See what happens. So the night before the big game, both teams hold rallies and bonfires in their back at home at their colleges. The coach, Frank Yost of Stanford, would say, quote, If we could cut out this last night, we would tear the Berkeley team into shreds and trample the remains into the earth. So, uh, a lighthearted game. Right. <laughs> People start pouring into the city, and stores start displaying the colors of the two teams, so a lot of cardinal, or that dark red Sean was talking about, and blue and gold. People on the streets are dressed in those colors. Even the opera house will hold a special night of La Boheme, and the colors are actually displayed there as well. The night before, horns can be heard in the streets and just more revelry than usual. So people are pretty excited for this, for Thanksgiving and for mainly for this football game. And you said this is, again, this is not just, I won't say outsiders, but tourists. I mean, this is people from all over that part of the, I mean, from both schools and alumni, but also all the different kinds of social strata in San Francisco as well are, are taking part in this. Yeah. Because I didn't expect the opera house that kind of, I thought right. that was kind of a surprising tidbit where they're, they're into it. So yeah, it's all over the city, but it's also a good way, the paper notes for people to make um, some money off of this game, well, selling yeah. things, selling flowers, selling whatever you need to do in order to you know, it's 1900. You're going to do what you need to do to get by. I don't think that much has really changed any anyway. That's probably now, true. right? I mean, you see some of these, like whether it's it's the the World Series or the Super Bowl or NASCAR or any of these, you know, the Indy 500. 
all of these big sporting events attract people and that is can you know those people want that because it's good for business generating yeah. that income and i think what took me by surprise was how it describes a lot of people will go more into it how they're dressed which is just like now people getting dressed up to go to a college game or a high school game or a professional game wearing you know the sweaters or the hats having the horns so you know they're dressed a little differently because of the time but the same kind of enthusiasm we would see at a professional game now the Chronicle reports that there are so many people expected they had to make more room in the stadium, so they add grandstands, they check out, they had some new bleachers installed, so they check those out to make sure that there's not going to be any danger. They move things around so there is extra standing room for people who want to pay to just come in. People are also betting on the game. Stanford is favored, but it's expected the game will be really close, a close match and highly fought. The odds the night before were 10 to 7 in Stanford's favor, but earlier in the week, there, it was even money on both teams. The players are also betting on the game, which Whoa. I found. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not Pete Rose time, I guess, huh? No. Yeah. But this is still, I mean, again, I think we don't want to belabor that fact, but this is in its infancy. So even collegiate football is relatively new, you know, maybe, you know, like we were saying, 30, 30 years at the outside, 40 maybe from organized play. So there's no professional league. There's no NFL. Right. Yeah. There so it it's a lot of and I think that is interesting when we're talking about some of these rivalries and how this goes back. These are really high, I won't say hyper local local but relatively local rivalries that everybody's getting behind. So the game is set to start at 2:30 p.m. Even more people pour into the city from surrounding areas on the day of the game. Stanford has a decorated train bringing people and the team in. The Stanford team stays at the Palace Hotel on Montgomery Street. People also traveled over from Oakland, from Berkeley, via boats. Um, so they're coming on ferries and stuff like that. The Berkeley team stayed at the California Hotel, which I believe was on Bush Street. Over 19,000 people flood the stadium. At this time, this was considered the largest attended sporting event west of the Mississippi. Did that saying, west of the Mississippi, come from this game? That's like a... You would hear that on growing up, like on Bugs Bunny, like <laughs> cartoons and stuff like that. But I'm just wondering, like this being in the paper saying biggest game west of the Mississippi, was that just a term or was that yeah. based on this? No, I, that's always been I, okay. ever since the kind of the West got opened up. The, the Mississippi is kind of the the demarcation line between the East and the West. Okay, I, I wasn't sure. I just no, I no, no, no. That's. No, I think we've heard it a lot on some of yeah. these older ones that we've looked at. Right. I, I think we've, I'm trying to think of the other one, but I know we've seen it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it's always that comparison. And it sounded as if people were wearing, as we talked about, like they're wearing the colors. I tried to find a picture because there was a description of a, a kind of a special hat that a lot of people from Stanford were wearing, I think. So I'm still looking for something I can, we can put up about that. Stores are also selling chrysanthemums in the colors of the two teams. Fans are dressed in school colors. They're carrying ribbons, it said, and women had parasols in the same colors of the team they were supporting. It was fashionable to wear corsages to the game. So you're wearing your, your Cardinal or mm -hmm. Stanford colors or your Berkeley colors. Men also wore the colors of their school on their lapels. And like now, people had horns, and I feel like I'm always sitting next to that guy when I go to a stadium. <laughs> Super annoying. <laughs> with the noisemaker, yes. like the giant horn. Oh, see, like I was thinking you were talking about like a Viking's hat with but horns. <laughs> oh, no, no, like a um, makes noise kind of horn. Okay. What I love, I, I love is that even though this is 120 years ago, that people are are this are, are getting this excited and they're they're the same right you watch sports now or you see like what it's like there's always that big rigmarole around like the no i'm blanking the professional football super bowl super thank bowl thank you that's right it's the super bowl but like the tailgaters and the people painting their bodies and the i mean we have a friend who it's not football, it's baseball, but we, we all have a, a mutual friend that, that paid money to go stand and look in a, in a hole in a fence when the Giants were playing, the, when the Giants uh, were in the series the first time. You know, uh, what was it, 10 years ago? So I, I just think it's, I think it's exciting that even though all of the other stuff has changed, you know. The, that excitement. That excitement the same. and that Yeah, stuff that is dedication consumed. and yeah. excitement. Yeah. yeah, it's parasols. And right. corsages, but right. yeah. Right. It's not motorhomes and barbecue tailgating, but. 
I might get behind uh, parasols and corsages, though. It was also a really beautiful day. It was described as the perfect weather with a kind of a bit of a chill. Tickets were $1, which would be about $31 now in 2020. A lot of people couldn't afford the price of admission, including a lot of the boys and young men who we'll be talking about in a minute. The other thing is that this was basically a sold out game. So there wasn't a lot of chance of getting inside the stadium if you didn't actually have a ticket already. It sounds like some were sold at the door, but there were a lot of people at this game. Police were stationed all around the stadium on the inside and the outside, anticipating that there would be large crowds and that something might go wrong because of that. Outside the stadium, people are looking for a way to see the game, so any way to see it. And all around the stadium are factories and rooftops. Some in, with a clearer view than others and some closer than others will have a picture of around the time up of this stadium so you can kind of see what's around it. So getting up on something where you actually have a clear view without having to be in the game is something people on the outside are looking for. One of those businesses was the Pacific Glassworks, and that was across the street from the stadium on 15th Street, and this had the best view, according to the newspaper. We also have a picture that we found, so you can kind of see what the view was like, but you could see the entirety of the stadium, the entirety of the football game. So it might even be a better view than some of the seats inside the stadium. The Pacific Glassworks manufactured and filled bottles for various products, including something called bitters. And when I read this, I just assumed that it was referred to the bitters that you use in mixed drinks. But at the time, it was actually something sold medicinally and described by the article in SF Weekly as mainly alcohol mixed with laxative. So it's sold as a cure-all for all of your ailments. Like snake oil. Right, yeah. The Glassworks had just undergone some renovations and was planning to be open the following Monday for business, so to, to finally be ready to go and make bottles. The main part of the factory was two very large furnaces that they used to shape the glass. The glassworks consisted of two buildings, each one about 100 feet in length, and each housing a large furnace. On this day, one of the buildings which held, like I said, a good view of the entire game was open and people were there working. The furnaces needed time to get up to the right temperature, so over the last month prior to this, they are working on it every day, trying to get it up to the heat they're going to need it for. And so they need to be on there on this day if they want it to be available and ready to go on Monday. What happened next is actually a little confusing, and there are a couple of different stories about exactly how it occurred. The man running the factory, a man named James Davis, had been worried about dangers during the game. So the main danger being that the furnace required oil to run, which was pumped through these large pipes that came in through different parts of the factory. This made the furnaces and everything inside very flammable, and even just something like a, a little cigarette could start a huge, uncontrollable fire. Davis was also really worried about the crowds, and police were also worried about this too. It was one of the reasons there were so many there. In fact, the stadium had given the glassworks passes to the game so that it could avoid people who worked there or who ran it or who owned it standing on the roof or watching the game from there. So they were given passes to avoid that. But the chance of a large crowd outside the stadium, it just remained because there are so many people in this area. As such, Davis stationed workers around the building and two watchmen at the front door of the building. These watchmen, they almost sounded like police, but they weren't. I don't know if they were workers that were kind of upgraded, but they kind of sounded like bouncers. Their job was to keep people out. And then he had, I think, with those two, about five workers around the rest of the building. Their task was to make sure no one would get inside or even near it. The building was also surrounded by an eight-foot wood fence on one side, and on top of that, that wood fence were two feet of barbed wire and a 12-foot fence on the other side. But despite this security, the streets were filled with children and men, a lot of boys, as we said, who were looking for a place to watch the game, and the roofs to watch the game were just, they were perfect, they fit the bill. According to the glassworks, gobs of people pushed through the outside of the factory so that they could climb to the roof. At one point, the crowd dismantled part of the fence so that they could actually get through. They climbed over other parts of the fence, so the factory says that they actually went over the fence. They saw people tunnel under the fence. They saw people remove boards from the fence, and there are witnesses who see this as well. You, you said there's fences all around there going around it, but to me, like, you got to get to a roof. Do, can you explain how they got up on the roof? Yeah, the newspaper said that they 
were pulled up by other people. So people used the fences, I think, to pull themselves up. And then they started pulling people up. So a lot of people were there with like their buddies or their friends. Uh, they also climbed things around the factory. I don't think there was anything like a ladder, okay. but there were, you know, containers and that kind of stuff. And so they just sort of like used it as steps, basically, to get up onto the roof. Okay. Davis will also say that he threatened the crowd with a metal pipe. So he just threatens to to beat them up, basically. Um, but there were just too many people to effectively stop them with their wood fences and the number of, of workers that they had outside. Other people, though, will actually come forward, including several children, to say that they were charged an entrance to the building. So this is supported by other witnesses who say that they saw at one point a line. So there are tons of people on the street, but they say they saw a line through one of the wood planks. And then the wood plank would kind of go up and one person or one child would be admitted in. And they couldn't really see what was happening behind that, but they could kind of see someone digging into their pockets. So in their minds... Someone was charging some money. It was like the speakeasy of college football. Exactly. Well, yeah, it could have been one of those guys that Davis hired to watch part of the fence, could have kicked a board open and then and then charged people, you know, whatever. Well, there are so many people. Cents. I could understand at one point thinking, why not? You know, they're going to get through anyway. Make it order. Oh, I see what you're saying. Make it orderly and somewhat more controlled, and then we can help hopefully stem the the mad rush of them trashing and destroying uh, fences. But what I will say is there doesn't seem to be one way people entered. There are people who say, yeah, we definitely just climbed over something and got up. Or uh, there's a group of boys who say that they saw, they, they weren't allowed to get up because of watchmen or workers there. And then a group of um, young toughs comes by, that's the word the paper uses, and just kind of tells the, the watchmen, no, we're coming through. And he threatens, they threaten him. So I think like a little gang of kids and he just walks away. There are also reports from kids who say they paid anywhere from 50 cents or so to get in to this, or they had a friend who paid money to get into this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's obviously, probably if there's that many people, a few ways they're getting in through the fences. So I think all of them happened is my guess. It sounds, I mean, we've all seen those news coverages of, of large gatherings, then you can sometimes see like the barricades yeah, and you know the one or two security guards or police officer, and the people are too much, and you see one crack in that line, and then it's just it's like water rushing in. Yeah, and it is important to note that when this crowd comes through to get to the glassworks, it is just workers and the watchmen that are there. So there, it is not police at this time that they're dealing with. It's just people who who chose to work there that day. Are there any are, police on premises? Like I, I will say, like were the police at the like now, I don't think it's any any stretch to think that, that there's some kind of police and, you know, well, we have ambulance drivers and things like that around a sporting event. Would the Did they have something like that around the big game? Yeah. So the at recreation field itself, there are police officers all around the inside of the game. There are police officers stationed at like the front entrance mm -hmm. of the game. And there are police station, there are police officers, I'm sorry, stationed around the outside of the field as well. This is just across the street. It does say that there were at least two police officers about a block away from this. And it will come out that one of the reasons is because police were worried about these large crowds mm -hmm. outside the stadium and what might happen. But at this time, there's no one else protecting the glassworks. Was it, when you say what might happen, was the feeling that you got from those, up, was it more like they were worried that the, that the people coming in would be like attacked by, by the locals? Or were they just worried about like crowds getting rowdy after a game and then? I'd say right. just as a precaution for okay. anything happening. There are, like I said, there are a lot of uh, businesses in the area, factories and that kind of thing. So I think they're worried about protecting, I, in part, those. You're probably right, worried about protecting some of the people inside the stadium. They might have just wanted to be there to watch the game. Um, we're going to talk more about what the police do and don't do. But they do. it does come out in an inquiry later that one of the things they were worried about were kind of a mass of people. And we do know that there was an interest in keeping people off the glassworks, the roof there because they gave them passes even prior to the game. So it is a known thing that, you know, people might try and get up on something they shouldn't. This is Cole from the Bungalow Chat Show, and if you're listening to this, that means you might like my show, because me and the Bungalow Babies get together every week and we chat about everything, everything under the sun, whatever comes to our minds. I get as many interesting guests as I possibly can. We cover as many topics that come into our little brains. We have fun, we laugh, we cry. 
And sometimes we just sit here and stare at the ceiling. You can listen to the audio version on all your favorite podcast platforms, and you can watch the videos on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. This is the Bungalow Chat Show. The roof on the glassworks was not a sturdy roof capable of holding people. It was a corrugated iron roof whose purpose was really ventilation. So running along the center of this roof and directly along the furnace beneath was a ventilator that was a few feet higher than the rest of the roof. So you have this roof that goes up like a roof, you know, kind of the triangle shape. And on top of that, you have a ventilator, which is just kind of like a stuck up section of the roof. And it runs along the hundred feet or so of the building. And it's an excellent place to watch the game because it's even higher than the roof already was. So people are choosing, once they get up there, to stand on it. They're sitting on it. They're leaning up against it. But that area of the roof is even less stable than the rest of the roof. The roof is designed just to hold up that ventilator, to let the furnace beneath it, the smoke, the acidity, the stuff that's coming out of it, release. So that part is even less capable of supporting people. Because its sole its sole reason for being is basically just to allow the air exchange from inside the 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 furnace room to the outside. Right. Yeah. But men of all ages begin to kind of pack onto this roof. There's difficulty here because it is the 1900s coming up with an official number. The number I saw most often was that there were about 500 to a thousand people who ended up on the roof. Wow. Yeah. It's a it's a lot of people for a roof that is not even meant to hold a couple. There are so many that at one point they look like a single mass. So they're on this roof and there's not even room between them. They're just kind of standing next to each other. There's not a lot of space. As people mob the roof, the workers began to worry. So there's workers underneath. The glass works will say that it only called in enough workers that it absolutely needed that day because they didn't want to have extra people there. Two workers in particular were working on the furnace that day. Their names are Clarence Jeter and Charles Yachts. And they become, they know the roof is not meant to hold people. And they're working on the furnace directly beneath the most dangerous part of the roof. So they become pretty scared that something's going to happen, that people are going to fall, that they might be smashed if that happens. And working in glasswork is already a difficult job. They're probably not getting paid very well. It's a dangerous job. There are no health precautions. Their, their job is to walk on this furnace in really dangerous ways to kind of stir it and keep it going. And they're breathing in acids. They're breathing in poisons. You'll see in a little bit how kind of disregarded they are as workers. But, you know, it's already difficult. And now they're constantly worried that the roof is going to collapse. And, and again, t- just to go back over that point you men- made earlier, the reason why that furnace can't be shut off is because it is so massive and it takes so long to get to the right temperature that to do that, they'd have to start, they'd ha- it would take one, it would take days and days and days and days for it to cool down. And then it would also take then days and days and days for them to get back up to temperature. So it has to be on, right? Yeah, I think. More than that, what it sounded like to me, I don't think it's on all the time. What it sounded like to me is more like tempering a pan or something like that. Mm-hmm. Your, this is a new furnace, um, and they're trying to every day or how, however long for that month, slowly work it up in temperature. So I imagine they work it up to a specific temperature, shut it off, then work it up to a higher temperature, shut it off. Because it's even precarious, as we said. It's dangerous. It can mm-hmm. blow up. It can fall over. All of that stuff. So... They are readying it for Monday, the day they need it to be at its highest temperature. And I really want to specify, I think, how large this furnace is. It runs much of the length of the building, and I have a picture from the newspaper that we'll put on our site. The furnace is long, but it's also tall, and the top part of it is like a half dome. It's covered with blocks of rock and fire brick and held together by two by posts, bands, and iron rods. The iron rods go across the furnace, and they actually make a sort of cage on top. There's only part of the furnace that has on the very top kind of an open flame area, but everything that surrounds this furnace conducts heat. So the bricks, the fire bricks, the rock, the pipes with oil, the pipes on top of it. So it's hot as well as, you know, so the furnace is hot as well as the bricks on the floor. There are 15 tons of molten glass on this day inside the cauldron. Inside the furnace, it was 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. And around the furnace, the heat was about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. How are the guys even able to be anywhere near that? That's crazy in 1900. 
Like I said, it's a very dangerous job and it's not a healthy one. For reference, a cremation oven gets anywhere from 1300 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And the lava from the Hawaiian Kilauea volcano varies from about 2,140 degrees Fahrenheit. So this furnace, especially on the inside, is very hot. Anything that goes into it or touches the inside will just be, it's just gone. You won't find evidence that a person or something was there. But on the outside, it's also 500 degrees. So landing on it or touching it is going to be instantly burned, that kind of thing. So as I said, Clarence Jeter and Charles Yachts become increasingly concerned that the roof is going to give way, that people will die, including themselves. This is not a situation where the glass works, sees that something terrible is happening and uh, gets people who are working there outside the building, where I think now hopefully that's what would happen. They're working directly underneath the crowd and under the most precarious part of the roof. It also seems management was concerned with this and a call is made to the chief of police in the downtown police station. That police station directs them to call the Mission Police Station on 17th Street, so this would be closer to where they are. And it seems that workers are told kind of different things at different times. At one point, they thought police were actually coming, but the 17th Station also tells them at one point that all of the police are not there at the station. They're there at Recreation Field, so they are not there to tell to go anywhere. And this is not, I mean, this is before cell phones. They're not, there's no way to check in. For emergencies, that kind of thing. So, so you're saying when they call, the, the, the police station actually says, actually, we don't have any cops. We can't help They're you. They're already down there. Yeah, we cannot help you. There's nothing we can do. Um, go talk to people down there. Eventually, they're told by the 17th station to find a lieutenant that's supposed to be at the game. So they send a worker from the glassworks to go talk to two police officers who are at the front entrance of the game. He tells them what's going on, what the worry is. And those police officers say that they won't go inside and get the lieutenant. Um, They also don't seem to be too interested in what's happening. They kind of brush them off. Workers also plead with other police officers that they see on the street, just asking them to please get the people off the the glassworks, but no one comes to help them. About 20 minutes into the game, it's reported that the the lieutenant inside the stadium noticed the huge crowd on the glassworks and instructed police to get to get the people down. Later during the inquest, this wouldn't be something that's brought up or discussed, and it seems like it might have actually been misreported. So during the inquest, the police will say, we were on our way to get people down? No. So when you go back and you look at what happens on this day, the newspaper reports that the lieutenant says he saw these people on the roof and sent officers. Okay. Later at the inquest, it's not something that they that the paper either reports on or comes up, but the police kind of say they don't know anything about this at the inquest. So I don't know if they changed their mind or if there were people on their way and they just didn't want to be held responsible later. I'm not really sure what happens. Same same thing happens a lot when you see tragedies, when everybody's looking for somebody to blame. There's a lot of misinformation or misreporting or just a lot of different opinions about what should have been done by who and when. Yeah. So what happens next happens in a tense moment on the field. The first half of the game had been very eventful, but neither team had scored. As one of the kickers lined up, the crowd on the roof shifted for a better view, and a crack was heard. A second later, the roof caved in, starting from the center where the ventilation shaft was. And remember, this shaft is directly over that furnace. The two workers, Clarence Jeter and Charles Yachts, who were inside, quickly moved out of the way as hundreds of men and boys fell into the glassworks, a great many of them directly onto the outside of the burning furnace. In a matter of seconds, the victims had either fallen into the building, on the furnace, or on the surrounding hard brick. The first to hit the furnace took much of the brunt of the fall. Not only had they fallen on this incredibly hot surface, but they had other men and boys fall on top of them as well. In fact, a lot of people will live because they fell onto someone and didn't have to get the full brunt of the furnace. Maybe part of them touched it, maybe none of them touched it, and they were able to hop off. And you're saying the outside of this furnace is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, yeah. And how long is the fall, would you say, to the furnace or even to the ground next to it? Uh, around to the, I think it was about 45 to 50 feet is From, what I saw. Oh, wow. It's still a very large fall. Yeah, yeah and a fall falling. you're not expecting. So there isn't a lot of discussion about, uh, I mean, there is here and there about people who fall because not everyone gets hurt or falls right on the furnace and gets burned. But, you know, like you're saying, falling, there are spinal injuries, there are head injuries. 
just because they're falling onto bricks as well. Yeah, you're falling 50 feet and then slamming into a hard surface or a hard surface that's 500 degrees or a slightly softer surface because it's a person that's yeah. on another person that might be on. Or you fall and then someone falls on you. Right. There's a lot of ways to get hurt in this, yeah. Other men and kids hung to pipes and rafters hanging from the ceiling. Over and over, they're trying not to lose their grip, but people do fall. So this is something the people who are working there are witnessing and the victims are witnessing. The workers below would spring into action just immediately. Clarence Jeter would immediately cut the flow of the oil to the furnace, so that's what's keeping it hot. But the oil is already running through the pipes, so the only way to get it out of those pipes is to let the furnace burn it out. Some of the pipes had also been damaged when the roof collapsed, so those pipes have oil sputtering out of them while the wild victims are on the furnace or around the furnace. These victims suffered terrible burns, but many victims hurt on the furnace began to suffer continually burning or cooking. There was a difficulty with the iron rods. Some people got trapped underneath them. So even though they're not a cage cage, you know, you're burning, you're not thinking, you're trapped underneath these rods that you that are all so hot that you can't pull yourself out of basically they've, they've fallen into a version of hell i mean every surface is scalding hot and continually cooking them while more and more people are falling from the roof right yeah lots of people fall on the pipes so even though they're not getting the full burn of the furnace those hot hot pipes are scalding them or burning them Charles Yachts worked to grab people off the furnace any way that he could. He even used the poker that he had in his hand. There are victims who are up on the the dome part, so they're too high to actually reach and touch. They're pulling them off in any measure that they can. So there's not a lot of thought process about how they're getting them off the furnace. They're just doing it quickly, kind of throwing them to the side and and then getting to the next person that they can. And while they're doing this, there's, if you can imagine, the unimaginable pain the smell, the, the things they're seeing, the things that they're hearing. There was a nine-year-old that was too far up to reach, so Charles is trying to pull people off this furnace, all the while a nine-year-old is, is cooking to death. The two men, uh, seeing everything, just they continued to work, though, almost on autopilot, continued to do whatever they could to help anyone. Men had fallen on the furnace and jumped off, burning themselves in the process. People had fallen on the brick, as we said, injuring spine, uh, heads, legs. There were a lot of broken bones, difficulty crawling out of the building. The sounds of the screams permeated the building, and the men focused on saving people. And Charles Yachts actually burns his own hands doing this. In the stadium itself, where the football game is being played, a great misunderstanding happens. When the roof caves in, someone in the crowd shouted, quote, it's a job. So the roof caves in, it makes a lot of noise, there's a lot of screaming. But in the crowd, they believe that this is meant, this is a kind of joke or ruse meant to distract the players in the hopes of gaining an advantage on the field. So when the man yells, it's a job, the rest of the crowd focuses back on the game and they just continue playing. The only people who can kind of see that there's still something going on are the people closest, the glassworks that are in the stadium. But even then, they can't see inside necessarily or what's happening. So the game just continues as if nothing has happened outside. Is that another term that I never heard? It's a job? I never heard that one either. Yeah, it sounded really like 1900s-y to me. I don't know. Yeah, I just it's just crazy that it just keeps going. But like you said, a lot of people didn't know except for the one person who thinks it's a conspiracy theory <laughs> yeah. and just yells, Again, it's a job. Not that much, yeah, not that much different than 2020. Yeah, and everybody weird. else is like, yeah, he's right. Let's keep focusing. Yeah, strange. Inside the glassworks, workers began using, as I said, whatever they could to pull people off. Clarence Jeter estimates that he pulled about eight men off and said that he believed his fellow uh, worker, Charles Yachts, pulled at least 20. They estimated about 70 to 80 men or boys had hit the furnace and even more hit the brick floor. And this is an interesting story because it's such a terrible event and there are hundreds of people hurt and harmed, but it's hard to get a clear estimate on exactly how many people are hurt. It's partially because it's 1900 and keeping records is a little bit different than now. But it's also because a lot of people hit the ground and it's described even with like limping, they just kind of walked away from the scene. They went home. Right. So there's not a lot of, of like clear understanding about how many people this really affected. Well, yeah, and I, I imagine the people that are standing on the top of the, of the roof of the glassworks aren't the ones that can afford to go to the game. 
So they're probably also those same ones that can't afford medical care. They'd be worried that they'd be charged for it. Or, or again, a lot of these like might be in for fear of, of being charged with trespassing or something else. They need, just want to get out of there. But like, yeah, also this time it's like these people wanted to see the game, but they probably work six days a week too. So they couldn't be, they're in fear of, they have to go to work also. They can't act like they're hurt. They need to get right, right back to work the next day. Right, and actually, it it was 1900. The average work week is six days a week, right. and the av- the average annual salary for a white worker is four hundred and forty nine dollars a year. They actually do break it down uh, by by different ethnicities. So if you're if you're not like if you're an immigrant or an African American uh, or unskilled, your annual salary could be as low as one hundred and fifty dollars a year. Which caught me when you were talking about the the price of a ticket only being a dollar. Wow, that's you know mm-hmm. still thirty bucks is in two thousand and twenty money. But for a worker, like you said, Sean, if I get hurt, I have to go to work tomorrow. So well, and as um, often terrible as our medical system, you know, insurance and all of that can really be. I don't think at this time that it's real common to think I've been harmed. I'm going to go down to the hospital. They will take people to the hospital here, but as you both said, it's very expensive. They have to work. But it's just the systems that we're used to and probably don't appreciate as much as we should aren't really in place here at this time. So the first to arrive outside the glassworks was the mounted police. And shortly other police were there. Um, They might have already been en route, but or they might have just, you know, seen what happened and come over. They move into action quickly, trying to help as many people as possible. Bystanders also helped. Um, There were people who took kind of like a, a taxi. It was horses and like a tiny little wagon uh, to the game. Like a rickshaw? Yeah, kind of like a little, it's pretty small. Yeah. Uh, Some of the police had buggies, which I kind of think my head think bigger, but when I saw pictures, they're actually kind of quite tiny. Um, So people are are in the area. They have horses. People rode their horses to the game. So some people who are around start helping. And those people start um, not only helping the people inside, but taking victims to hospitals. So there's a lot of discussion of, you know, like someone throwing, there's a lot of back and forth trips. So there's someone who you're throwing a victim on the back of your horse and just taking off to one of the hospitals and coming back over and over and over. And this is just, I think, a lot for everyone to see. I saw several instances where people are found unconscious and instead of taking them to the hospital, they just take them back to their homes, as we were talking about, which I think now seems kind of unfathomable. Uh-huh. It would seem the worst injuries were those that hit the furnace, as we talked, but many hit that brick floor. And everything from spinal injuries to serious head injuries one detective estimated that when he walked into the, the building that there were about 200 men and boys kind of just writhing in pain on the floor of the glassworks. That number will change depending on the article or who's giving it to you. I think, I think people are hard to count. They're also under a lot of stress because of everything that they're seeing. But there are a lot of people who are hurt. Firefighters also come to the scene and begin helping people down from the walls and the hanging beams who are still ha- you know, hanging there from dear life. There was a story of one man who went from the roof. He fell. He did a couple of somersaults in the air and reached out and grabbed a metal rod. But that's a rare story. Oh my God. That's not the common story here. Whoa. The dead were piled quickly on a south wall of the glassworks. So they're just working to help the people right now who are still living. Seven men and boys were killed instantly. Although I think the word instantly based on, because the paper does go into very it's very descriptive about what happens. I think the word instantly here is carrying a lot of the weight. Uh, in fact, these people died very, very, very painfully. The furnace itself isn't meant to hold weight, so at one point it cracks and falls. Improvised ambulances are created using buggies and people are carried out on makeshift stretchers. A lot of those stretchers are made from pieces of the roof that had fallen. In all, it took about 30 minutes to clear the scene and lots of people helped. That's amazing. To think that there were a thousand people and hundreds of people injured, but only 30 minutes to, to, to clear them. I, I think at the same time, you got to think that not everything's common, but these kind of things, I think people were just kind of up to the task. They might have saw this a lot. You think about like other incidents during this history, like 
it's later in the years, but like the Triangle Fire or things like that, you had these just tragedies, these large tragedies constantly, and everyone goes, here we go, let's do it, and they all get right, together right. and help. Nowadays, you see it, and it's like, I'm, I'm not trying to sound old, but like a lot of people are filming things or stuff like that. Not everyone's jumping into the fire or whatever like that. And I'm not saying people that are filming are wrong. I'm just saying it's a different scene. Well, they're not, they're not, I don't believe we're as prepared or, or like, I think you're right, Sean, that idea of when you live in a place that could go up in, as, in like a, in a second, because it's a tinderbox and you are, you're around the constant threat of, death and dismemberment because of of the jobs you have and i imagine a lot you're i think you're absolutely right i think a lot of these guys the civilians and stuff probably worked in the area and are used to this kind of i won't say not on this scale but to see these kind of injuries and just and and to be able to leap into action right away it's a a conditioned response where i don't think a lot of us i'd like to think that if something happened i would i would know what to do and and but i I worry that I wouldn't because it's not something that's normal to me. Right. And there were a lot of other terrible events that happened around the same time. I've been working on a bonus episode about a boat that sank. And I, when I looked into it, I mean, that's happening all the time. There are so many instances of that off the California coast. And also there's a lot of like train accidents and things like that. So I think, Sean, you're probably right that there's also, they're kind of used to these kinds of terrible things happening. Which is a sad, I mean, it, that is really, truly a sad thing to s- th- think about, that you live in a world that this type of tragedy, while, while tragic and horrific, is something that you would be, I won't say inured to, but it, it's, a com- it's commonplace enough to where it's not, it's not shocking or it leaves the newspaper in a few days. And you still have to work six out six days a week. <laughs> yeah, and then tomorrow morning I gotta I gotta go to you know go to work with fourth degree burns and a broken. Yeah, I think it probably is important to note though that it does not get talked about anywhere in the newspaper or in the inquest or anywhere. But the effects of both experiencing this and seeing it helping the people that kind of PTSD or mental anguish that that would cause, which I think it would still cause people at this time. They would have to keep moving, as you said, because you have your your job to go to. But I mean, that's what people do now too, a lot of times, but it's, and we're going to talk about it a little bit in a minute, but it is not brought up by the paper. This is not a time when that's kind of something that is considered. And I know we're still fighting a lot of the time to consider that now as important, but yeah, first responder P- PTSD or just bystander PTSD yeah. is something that I think now, hopefully, it's it's more talked about. But I do think that there's sometimes when when people talk about things that happened in in the not so distant past, it's it's a feeling like, well, they didn't experience it back then. They did. They handled it differently and not in good ways. Yeah. You know, it could have had long lasting repercussions with a lot of these people that manifested in, you know, whether it's substance abuse or, or other types of abuse. Well, and it's interesting because there's not a lot of discussion about the spinal injuries or the head injuries. I mean, they're mentioned, but you know, we obviously know a lot more about that now and the long-term complications of those things. There are a lot of stories of men throwing victims, as I said, on horses and then racing back and forth. So they're doing this very, very quickly. They're talking a lot about how the horses at the towards the end of this are kind of frothing at the mouth. They're very, very tired, uh, as are the men. There was a story of a police officer who used his small buggy to transport victims. It sounded as if a lot of the rescuing was just done on autopilot. This officer filled his buggy each time as full as possible, and then he would carry each victim into the hospital, just working as quickly as he could. The last victim he took to the hospital was a young child, and he was just working so quickly he didn't realize when he's carrying him into the hospital that he had he was already deceased. So he has trouble at that moment because it's the last person he has to carry in there, letting that letting him go. And I just think it's important to to remember those things because seeing this and dealing with it could not have been easy, as we were just talking about. Nurses were sent to the scene to deal with bandages, splints, just anything they could assist with. There were doctors at the game, so some people came out from the game. Um, Other doctors came from around the city to help. Priests from the mission came to the scene to give last rites. And as many people who came to the scene to help, there were also lots of people who just came to see what had happened. They cheered on people taking victims back and forth. But the paper also describes a crowd really interested particularly in seeing children, and particularly they wanted to see mangled bodies. So again, that's not that much different than 
2020, I think it's fair to say that most people have a, a morbid curiosity about those things. Yeah. And I think it's also sometimes hard to know what to do. I don't know if everyone walks into these situations and just picks someone up on your horse and, you know, there, there are those people who do that and some people who will be taking it in, in other ways or who wouldn't, you might make the situation worse. I just don't know that it's for everyone, but it is hard to imagine that kind of crowd gathering. Hospitals around the city fill up. The hurt and dying are taken to the city county hospital. They're taken to the railroad hospital, to St. Luke's hospital, and even the central receiving hospital. So they're spread out around the city. Parents of the boys also begin to come to the scene. The newspaper has a heart-wrenching story of the father of 11-year-old William Eckfeldt. He came to the scene to look for his son and saw two small legs peeking out underneath the pile of deceased bodies. He recognized the socks the child was wearing, and uh, he instantly knew it was his son. The head, though, of the child was covered by a cap, so the father began to yell out to try and run towards the boy. The police held him back, but he was crying and yelling so desperately and pleading with the officers. At one point, one of the officers holding him just could no longer do so and kind of fell apart emotionally himself. Other officers continued to hold him until a bystander walked over and removed the hat covering William's face. His father recognized him instantly and just fell apart and pleaded with the officers to be able to take him home. Lots of other parents came looking for their kids, but this is not a social media world. So this is not like they knew what had happened. They had gone to sit down for dinner and their child hadn't returned home yet. And so they just went out looking for them. Uh And what they come upon is this. And lots of parents also didn't even know their children had gone to the football game. So there are people who are deceased, uh, some of them kids, so parents are looking for them. But there are also people who've been, kids who've been hurt and been taken to a hospital. So now parents have to find where they are. And this is not easy to do in 1900. Once all the hurt have been transported to hospitals, coroners come to the scene. They place the bodies one by one on sections of the corrugated roof. Police, four at a time, carried them to buggies. The last makeshift stretcher carried was filled with errant, Um, hats and bloody clothes from the scene, and then the buggies took off in a procession to the morgue. The hospitals were filled with victims. There were so many that they were placed in every hallway, in every waiting room, in every just kind of nook and cranny. Families flooded to the hospitals looking for their loved ones. The paper described mothers so upset they weren't allowed in until they calmed down. The process for finding your hurt deceased loved one was just going to a hospital and looking. People also came in under the pretense of finding a loved one just to see the wounded. Unfortunately, there were also people who came in and robbed victims. So they robbed the wounded. They also robbed doctors. Uh, They robbed, you know, whoever was there uh, of all sorts of things too. Personal items, clothes, and then anything like money or anything like that. And there's so many people who are hurt. And then there's so many people looking for loved ones that it's it's really impossible to tell the difference between what people are are doing. It sounds like a lot of chaos, really. Mm. The coroner put the dead in a line, and people lined up along Merchant Street to see them. There were so many people that police officers had to control the line. And this is, this is how they identified the victims, but it's also a way to see the victims. And we should note that I th- that's really uncommon for now, but it is not uncommon at the time. We talked about this in the Emma Ledoux episode, right. when they would put you know mm-hmm. someone who'd been deceased out for people to see. I know back in the day they would... Um, robbers and stuff they once they were deceased they might yeah. go from town to town you actually could way back in the day in california uh you could pay money to see the head of joaquin marietta in a wine jar or the you know hand of three-fingered jack also during um in new york during the draft riots in the 1860s after those riots happened they were lining the streets with the victims and allowing the families to come through and it was you'd have to look through all of them to to find your loved ones so you're right. I don't. I don't think it's. I think now we have a certain distance between well, yeah. ourselves and and those kind of events and better methods for identifying right. victims. I think, right, 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 but right. yeah. At the glassworks, everyone was sent back to work. Even Clarence Jeter and Charles Yachts, who had just gone through something really unimaginable, his hands and are Yachts, burnt. Yeah, his hands are burnt, and he has to go back to work that Gosh, day. So God. Yeah, like we said, not a not a good time for workers' rights. No. Uh, randomly, I just put this in here because we're a true crime podcast, in the midst of all this, a murderer is actually found. A young man police have been looking for named Albert Lukes was on the roof and dislocated his shoulder. Police have been searching for him because he had murdered a playmate by stabbing them. He was brought to the game by his brother. His brother actually goes on to save a bunch of lives at this event. 
But I just thought this was an interesting. That's crazy. So, do you know how old Albert Luke's was? I do not. I looked for it because it was interesting because he a he murdered someone, but the newspaper specifically says a playmate. So I'm thinking that he's young, younger. Right? Yeah. The game between Stanford and Berkeley continued. It sounds like it was quite the game. It lasted about two hours, and the final score was five to nothing, with Stanford winning. The game itself was tied 0-0 zero to zero throughout its entirety until the last five minutes when a place kicker made a field goal, giving Stanford five points. Oh, weird scores. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of points for a field goal. Yeah. And that, they won the game. How much is a field goal normally? Three. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, like I said. No, it stuck out to me. I was like, five. Right. The game ended at dusk, and the teams and fans celebrated on the field. Afterwards, they all marched in a parade to the Palace Hotel, where a rally was held and speeches were made. The Glassworks tragedy was kind of mentioned in these speeches, but in the newspaper, the quotes are really about football, so that the focus is still on the game. And I mean, these people didn't necessarily experience it, but it is something that happened. And their their parade didn't go past the bodies, correct? I think they would have already been moved by that point, okay, by okay. the time the game was over, but and it didn't Glassworks say... would have been back running at full speed. <laughs> the newspaper said... Yeah. The newspaper said that uh, people's excitement about the game was a little tampered than it was in previous years. So, but they're still out celebrating, and it's just weird. Like it, you have a tragedy that happens less than a hundred yards from your actual game, but we're still gonna have our parade, and we're still gonna we're gonna make our speeches, and you know, it's just a. I really feel it's like a different time, Charles. It's hard to it's hard to put ourselves in the shoes because the tragedies might have happened all the time and we would want to think you know but then it's like eh, football game <laughs> like you just don't know well you know i yeah i would like to think it's a it's a different time but i i really wonder i also think it might have been something in two different kind of people if that makes sense not good or bad just you identify with victims we've talked a lot yeah. about that through the season and you know they weren't there they didn't see it they didn't have to save anyone um, so it's not as freshly on their mind. The majority of them probably are not necessarily. They're either outsiders from that area. They're visitors to the city, you know, or they're or entirely different social strata. I, and, I, and I understand and agree with the, your statement about being different times. I also would add, I do think that, that we do have some tone deafness even now when it comes to certain national tragedies. And depending on whether they're directly related to us or not and i think there that still that still resonates with me that idea that people can just and I, again i i count myself among them you know if sometimes if a tragedy d- isn't directly connected to me or in within within my sphere i might downplay it or just kind of it you know it encompasses all of 30 seconds that i watch the news or read the news and then you know forget about it the next breath the only stories that I saw where there was kind of any relation to, to either of the colleges was that uh, there was a little boy, I guess, in Stanford who had been kind of adopted as a, like unofficial mascot. He would sell things outside the stadium. Mm-hmm. His brother, I don't remember if he died or got hurt in this, but that was something that connected them. But other than that, there didn't seem to be any connection between the victims and anyone at the school or at the, at the game. Also, the newspapers at the schools cover the game later in the week when they write about it and they don't mention this event at all. So this is something that does really get in a lot of ways lost to a lot of history. Quickly, the coroner put together an inquest to look into the disaster. A few days after the event, 22 men will have died. Most of them, um, about 13 of them under the age of 18, a 19 year old also died. The youngest was nine years old and the oldest was 46. The Glassworks put out a letter and continued to maintain they held no responsibility for what happened there. The inquest started in a courtroom in San Francisco's Hall of Justice on Wednesday, December 5th, 1900 at 7.30 p.m. There were lawyers, a jury, uh, they had a judge. The room was filled with victims and the family of the victims. Over the week prior to this, about 200 people have been interviewed and over 50 witnesses will be questioned in court. The goal is to assign blame for the tragedy and to see if all proper precautions had, been ta- had taken place. At this time in California, the law had something called contributory negligence. And according to that SF Weekly article I talked about, this meant that if the victims could be blamed in any small way for, the, for what happened to them, so even just a tiny percentage 
was was attributable to them, then they had to carry all the responsibility for it. That This is no longer a legal strategy one can use under the law in California, but I don't know what you guys think about that kind of idea. So what you're saying is, for example, they put up a fence with barbed wire, they had guards, but it but since the since the people broke through or got through in some way and were up somewhere they didn't belong they were trespassing it's their fault they were there because they shouldn't have been in the first place then i as the owner of the glasswork have no responsibility correct. whatsoever yeah correct the responsibility lies with the victims of this devastation in its entirety so no one ever gets sued from this situation which is very different than i think than now yeah, I don't think, I, but I also think that's not that uncommon for that time. You, you right. Know? Well, and that's because of this. If a victim right. can be, uh, I think the weekly used 1%. If you're 1%, one tiny little 1% responsible in any way for what happened to you, then you're 100% responsible. I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on this one because I think in one respect, they did, I mean, they did break and enter, you know, mm-hmm. they, they jumped the fence. They weren't where they're supposed to be. The roof wasn't designed for that. I, I mean, in 1900 in San Francisco, I'm not familiar with building codes, but I can't imagine that there is that there is the same safety protocol. I know there's not the same safety protocol for building buildings that there are in 2020. I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like with this instance, it's hard because most of them were kids. <laughs> I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to blame under 18 year olds for wanting to watch a game and everyone else is doing it so i mean sure i'll blame that 46 year old who broke through a fence to get on a roof but the nine-year-old who might have saw a 46 year old get up there i'm not putting any blame on the nine-year-old yeah and i think that it'll get even uh, as they interview people here or we talk about what they say in court it'll get a little more fleshed out that maybe there's not a single person to be responsible but it there are a lot of things that could have changed this event and it's Yeah, outcome. i think that I, I agree with that. I think that's the tragedy is that there's always things that could be done but and i'm i'm not saying i'm i'm putting blame on the victims necessarily. And i think our definition of what a child is that has to be looked through the lens of of 1900s I a sixteen year old, I a sixteen, that. yeah, yeah, a sixteen year old, nineteen hundred is not the same thing as a right, sixteen year old. Because he was probably but there was a nine year old. Yeah, he was, but the nine year old was probably working in the factory. He was probably on top of the roof, smoking and drinking, watching a, a football game. I mean, <laughs> it's the nineteen hundred, so I, that's what that's how I picture it. Yeah, but well, I'm trying to imagine this this kind of legal turn now, and in a lot of the cases that we cover where people are trying to blame victims. We've talked about this quite a bit. Right. And so this would kind of change that altogether. It reminds me of, in a small sense, the idea that when you sign up for like a a web product or a new piece of technology and you have to sign the, do you accept all the terms and, and, and rules. And I, as I'm going to assume most of us don't necessarily read all of them, but then whatever happens is my fault because I didn't read it, but it's so complex that I can't, that, most people wouldn't be able to understand the the, the ramifications of those terms and con, uh, terms and contracts. But with this certain situation, it feels like if it was 2020, you have a fence up. the The main thing here would that you would have to have signs visible from every angle that just said no trespassing, and then you could probably yeah. get away with it and blame the victims. But I feel like with this kind of situation, it's still kind of close to it now. And there are no signs that anyone right. talks about. There's not even signs that suggest that the roof is dangerous. And James Davis, who is the superintendent of the Glassworks, if you remember, he's actually one of the first people that they question in court. He talks about a lot of stuff we already talked about, threatening the crowd with metal pipe, having stationed men around um, the facility, that he only had necessary workers on the premise, that they were worried about people breaking through. But he also admits that he didn't tell any of the people who came through the gates that the roof was dangerous. He didn't send someone up to the roof to say, this could fall in, this is super dangerous. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he says in court that he didn't even know people were on the roof, which I just kind of found an odd thing to say. Or yeah, odd coming from what we had learned in the newspaper. And considering the construction of the building, it's a it, the ventilation. I mean, I can imagine that the sound is deafening, probably on the furnace floor and stuff like that. But I can't imagine you wouldn't be able to see some kind of 
hint or hear something from anywhere on the factory that there are a thousand people standing on a corrugated iron roof. Yeah, I think from the get-go, the glassworks says they are not responsible for this right. and really push that. So I think this is, it's impossible for me to believe, unfortunately, that he's telling the truth here because... Like of everything we've already talked about and all of the workers being worried about it and them calling the police and those people are saying they're instructed to do that. So just I think he's trying to make sure they're not, you know, held responsible. Workers back him up on most of what he says. One worker also said that he was directed to call the chief of police, as I just said. During that call, they transferred him to the 17th Street Police Station, and he told the policeman who answered the phone that they needed help and were in danger. The policeman, as we said, told him he couldn't do anything because all of the police were out of the stadium. He was instructed personally to find that lieutenant. He went to the gates of the stadium. He asked to get in. The two officers said he couldn't. The judge asked him why he didn't just buy a ticket and go inside, and the worker says that he didn't have the $1 to go inside and get the lieutenant. And by the time he got back to the glassworks, the roof had failed. So already we have someone here who, if they could have talked to someone in charge, they just had the money to do so, really. Well, and which what is a, kind of what a dumb thing to say, too. You know, oh, if you had a buck, why wouldn't you? You know, no, he he wasn't there to see. He was at work. So I'm trying to help people, and right. you're gonna you're gonna fault me for being stopped and and not having the over a day's wage to pay to go find somebody to do their job to keep people from dying. Yeah. When asked if the worker believed the police might have changed the outcome of this, he says emphatically yes. Several other workers testified that they asked for cops' help only to get brushed aside. They also include calling the station several times. On the stand, the policeman at the main office branch downtown says he did receive calls about the roof and that he forwarded them to the 17th Street station. But officers at the 17th Street Station testified that they never received any calls or word about the situation, though dealing with a large crowd was something that they were meant to be doing while they were there. At one point, a juror actually expresses anger that the police didn't do anything to help the situation. Yeah, that almost seems like the 17th Street Station is kind of uh, covering their own rear. Yeah. Of like, oh, we never got a phone call. And again, it's not 2020, so it's not like you can pull up phone records. Workers at the Glassworks testified that they did everything they could, but victims testified, as we said, to different scenarios. So some didn't recall anyone stopping them from getting on the roof. Some testified that they were stopped only to have, you know, someone else come up and, like we said, the gang of, like, street youths threaten them and then they let people through. There was testimony about that they knew that they had paid certain workers or mm -hmm. someone who was keeping them from, coming, from getting inside. And they also testified to things like taking down the fence. So it, I think a lot of different things were happening around the glassworks. At the end of the inquest, the decision was that the victims were responsible for their own deaths and for their own um, injuries, and that there was no blame to go around. A few years after the big game disaster, the last known victim would die from severe spinal injuries, bringing the total deceased to 23. In a lot of the articles, it's estimated that over 80 others are injured. But as I said, this is a hard number to pin down because not everybody went to the hospital. Not everybody got help. Not to mention they weren't accounting for things like traumatic brain injury, which at the time isn't mentioned in the paper, but we now know mm -hmm. can cause very, a lot of problems later in life. One of the things that didn't come up in any article that I read, and I, we talked about it a little bit, and I think I've been thinking a lot because while I've been researching this, there's so many um, interviews with nurses and doctors dealing with things like COVID and the emotional things that they're going through. And I'm thinking about all of the workers in this case, all of the bystanders, um, the two men at the factory who saved or tried to save so many people's lives, the things that they saw, and the effect that probably had on them throughout the rest of their life. Saving people takes a physical toll, but it also has that mental cost. It's why I included the details here because I think... You know, even though it happened a long time ago and there's a lot of stuff that we're surprised about, it has, still has lessons for us today on how we treat each other and how we treat people who have to be involved in the consequences of terrible events, you know, school shootings, terrible diseases, things like that. I mean, this whole thing, it's it's hard. It's 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 a terrible tragedy. And like being back then, it's just when you were describing the fall and just being on a furnace, it was it was horrible. Like, it was so bad. I did not want to think about it at all. Just a bad thing. And it's just funny. Like, it's not funny, but 
looking up the research like I did for the big game, this one wasn't even considered. They didn't bring it up on their like page or anything. You have to find it a different thing. This wasn't considered one of the the important big games, maybe because it was only five zero, but they didn't bring up any of the other stuff around it. I think that's that that's shocking to me as well. Yeah, I'm with Sean. This is a terrible tragedy, and it's one that you can't help but go back and look at and say what could have been done to prevent it. You know, would signs have done had Davis actually done more to warn people off at the same time you know standing up to a crowd with a metal pipe trying to keep them out of a factory you know having the fence having the guards again not trying to victim blame but this is one that it's a tragedy and it it seems like there are things that could have been avoided least of which the police at the time seem like there are so many unanswered questions or and so many of like well too bad and then just the skipping over it and moving on and and then you know the whole class divide between not to put too fine a point on it but the rich people inside the stadium and the poor people outside the stadium who happen to be more than likely a good chunk of them immigrants you know mm-hmm. and then like Sean was saying the fact that it's not mentioned a lot that it's not that it is kind of a forgotten story is is a it's another layer of that tragedy and it's sad to me that it's such a forgotten story because it's such a terrible event and i tried to be as respectful as i could of the victims the papers go into great detail and we never want to do that just to throw that in there or i don't know to entice people to listen but they also talk a lot about the heroes, the people who helped, mm-hmm. the people who sacrificed themselves to help. And when you forget a tragedy, you forget the people who died, you forget the people who were hurt, but you also forget all of the people who did something over the top to make a difference. Some some random guy just walking home from work or, or yeah. taking out a Thanksgiving Thursday stroll and then happens to see this and leaps to their aid. The two guys that were working on the furnace throwing people to safety and burning themselves hurting themselves i yeah yeah it's good to see that like 120 years ago uh we still had the thanksgiving tradition of football we still had heroes jumping up but maybe it's good that we don't have west of the mississippi or it's a job used a lot anymore that that can go away from then (laughs) but i mean it could have happened now in a way just trying to show how people come together like and when it does like 9-11 you had all those people going down there and figuring it out right and i think it just we don't have many tragedies like this as often as i think that they had in the 1900s because things just always happen <laughs> you know you had yeah. devastating earthquakes you had ship sinking you had fires you had people falling through roofs that's just happened and more people jumped to the fact because they probably just helped someone else like a a roof probably collapsed a week before (laughs) who knows like back then because it's not (laughs) documented very well so but it's good to see that they're still heroes now and then despite the horror of this story the 23 men and boys who died and the countless others who were hurt this story isn't one that is remembered there isn't a memorial to the event in san francisco I can't tell you why that is. Maybe because the victims were found by the law to be responsible. Maybe because the people it affected the most were not of great means, and many families couldn't afford grave markers. Maybe because in 1906, an even bigger disaster happened in San Francisco in the form of an earthquake. Regardless, this Thanksgiving we remember the victims of the big game disaster of 1900. There will be a list of the victims and the heroes on our website at californiatruecrime.com. (laughs) 